You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Welcome to a series called The Leadership Challenge. I'm John Scott, and this is an INCJ, INCJ podcast and YouTube. There are many different leadership roles in the justice system and many leadership styles and issues. At INCJ, we want to give people a conversational opportunity to explore what it's like to be a leader by asking questions and seeing where the answers take us. So we've started conversations with criminal justice leaders to ask about their experiences. Our hope is that sharing answers will help find solutions and fresh ideas about improving the system we work in. If you want to follow the series, you'll find it on our website or on a YouTube as or as a podcast at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INCJ Network. The title of this podcast is Thought Leadership. Thank you for joining us and listening. Let me introduce today's guest, Professor Rob Canton from De Montfort University, who's had a long and distinguished career as a probation officer, a trainer an academic and writer, both in the United Kingdom and internationally, where he's worked in many countries and served on significant Council of Europe committees. Welcome to Rob Canton. Thanks very much for joining us, Rob. Now tell us where you are today and about your latest book, which I think is just published. John, thank you for that very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Where am I? I'm um, in the place called, I'm at home, um, uh, which is a little place called Keyworth, not far from Nottingham. And my affiliations and connections with Nottingham are proclaimed perhaps by the nature of the scarf hanging proudly behind my my head. Um, I don't come from this part of the world originally, but I've now lived here for a very long time and have been a loyal forest supporter for about tw nearly 25 years. So I miss the great days of Clough. I wasn't really uh, particularly a football fan around those times. Enough of that. Um, the new book, uh, as you say, kindly, came out in June. So it is very much hot off the press. It's simply entitled Punishment, and it's in a series called Key Ideas in Criminology, of which the general editor is one of the uh, Europe and the world's most distinguished criminologists, Professor Tim Newburn at the London School of Economics. It's my second book on the topic of punishment. Uh, in 2017, I published a book which was called Why Punish? An Introduction to the Philosophy of Punishment. Among the subjects that I studied as an undergraduate was philosophy. <clears throat> and I have long felt in my studies in probation and in associated criminological topics that philosophy has not made as strong a contribution as it might have done. Criminology is a, a, a subject that is famously referred to as a, a rendezvous discipline. A lot of different subjects come to bear here. And many of my colleagues are proud of their affiliations with sociology. That's not my background, though, of course, I recognize its fundamental importance to, uh, to an understanding of crime and criminal justice. But the first, this, this earlier book, this Why Punish, um, was an attempt to see what philosophy might bring to this, to try to clarify some of the debates. But this, the new book begins perhaps by reminding myself, of <clears throat> myself and the readers early on of a challenge that was made by David Garland, who's one of my intellectual heroes, which is that philosophers turn towards the question of the justification of punishment without any proper understanding of what punishment actually is. So this book is much more of a social sciences uh, text than it is a philosophy text, because for me, we need both of these uh, topics working in, in synergy. Many of us, I think, write and study in this area because we want to change things for the better. If you want to do that, that's certainly one of my inspirations. And if one does want to do that, you need to have an understanding of what shapes the character of criminal justice and, and perhaps specifically probation. Although I have to say my book isn't particularly about probation. Um, but you need to know what determines the character 
in order to assess the potential for change, the possibilities of resistance to change and so forth. But you also need uh, moral insights to help you to identify the direction of change, what would be an improvement for the better. And I think sometimes that question is insufficiently exposed. And for me, it's very much about a starting point of human rights and about justice. What's your audience for the book, Rob? <clears throat> it's it's hard to hard to gauge, really, isn't it? I mean, originally the I think that the whole series is intended for perhaps later study. It's not an introductory text, and indeed, it's not a textbook at all. And I was asked to to frame an argument, not just to try to describe systems of punishment wherever they might be and whenever they might have been, but to try to set out to argue a case. Um, and if we, we wish, I can tell you a little bit more about that, what that case is in due course. But it's for undergraduates mainly at a later stage in their studies. It's not an introductory text. And of course, for postgraduates and for people who are engaged in the, in the, in the business that we are. And, and I hope that one or two practitioners and, and managers might pick it up. But I know their desks are crowded and that that may be a bit of a challenge for people to make time to do that. Mm. Is writing your natural habitat? I certainly have always enjoyed it. Um, sometimes it doesn't come easily, but I think all writers experience that. And I don't mind telling you that a few months into the, the, the writing of this latest book, I didn't get so much writer's block as just kind of thinking, I've said what I wanted to say in my earlier book. What am I now going to say that's a little bit different? Um, so all writers get stuck. And the way in which I unstick myself is to walk. And sometimes this is a little bit sad, uh, but I may as well confess it. I have with me, I always walk with my telephone. And I suppose a lot of us take our phones everywhere, don't we? And sometimes I will pause on my walk and dictate something into my phone just in case I forget it later on, because I do find that physical movement frees up uh, the head and sometimes unknots uh, problems and predicaments that have held you up. Mm. So is your process that you dictate and then transfer it to the page. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, I use voice controlled software quite a lot, even when I'm writing, just to get things out quickly in, a, in rough, and then I can begin to, to polish them and, 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 and try to refine them. But I think that, um, I mean, for me, it's always been a matter of reading something and saying, is this what I wanted to say? And if it is, fine. And if it isn't, have another go. Mm. Mm. What I wanted to ask you is, how does writing compare with teaching as a way of getting your ideas out there? I think the, the best kind of teaching is a better way, in a sense, because of the opportunities for personal engagement. Now, of course, these have been limited a little bit in lockdown, but INCJ has been among the pioneers in showing us that you can still carry on communicating um, in this way. But what I miss when I write, and sometimes indeed I've done lectures from my desktop during lockdown, and what is completely missing is the interaction, the chance for people to ask, to challenge you, to ask you to explain, to test out their own ideas. And I think it's probably true to say that, well, I'm sure it's true to say that over the years, I've learned a lot as a teacher from those with whom I've um, engaged in, in dialogue. Um, but that's not been possible uh, after lockdown at all because there's no kind of interaction. So I miss that. But I think a, a good a seminar, better than a lecture, just talking at people is probably in no way superior to writing. OK, um, are books oh, oh, the only way of being an influencer now? I noticed that you're pretty active on Twitter. Yeah, Twitter's a, a very much a mixed blessing, isn't it? I don't know what your experience is of it, John. I, the, the, a problem for t I find with Twitter um, is, well, it, you know, sh simply the length of it. You cannot say anything useful on Twitter. And there are some particularly hot topics that I have very carefully avoided. 
because um, Twitter, I think, often forces people to take sides, to take up one position or another in a topic of, of significant complexity. So I don't do that. But what I have sometimes done, I also run a blog, um, which I don't use ever so often. But if I do post a new piece on that blog, I will use Twitter to draw attention to that and invite people to have a look if they wish, because otherwise I'm not sure how they'd know that I know how they would know that I had made a, a new posting. But Twitter I use mostly for advertising, not only my own work, but I try to retweet and give a leg up to colleagues. Uh, but I use it mostly for fun. I don't use it for sustained argument. Mm. So let's think about this thought leadership idea and where your books fit in trying to influence people's thinking. Yeah, the idea of putting it in the way that you have of, of thought leadership has not been particularly in my in my mind. It's not so much that I want people to. I mean, leadership perhaps implies that where you lead, others might come to follow. And I think very often what I'm attempting to do is not try to convince people um, of any particular case, but getting them to think about the subject in a different way. And, and maybe I can give you an example of this from my recent book, because I said earlier that I argue a case in this book. And one of the cases is that we punish too much. Uh, which is banal. I think an awful lot of people feel that. But the the more the reasons why I think, okay, let me take a pause. One of the things that I think has been neglected over the years is the contribution that emotion makes towards our will to punish. So punishment as an institution is is ubiquitous. Throughout human history, at all times and places, people have recognised the desire to repay a wrong with inflicting some kind of harm or imposition on, on the wrongdoer. Of course, there are other ways of responding as well, but, but that the recognition of that, people understand that, they get that, that's, that's utterly a familiar part of the human condition. The idea that emotion contributes to that has become increasingly apparent to a number of scholars who've written very illuminatingly on, on that particular topic. But I've tried to say, well, what are these particular emotions? Can we be a little bit more specific? And the three emotions that I particularly elaborate in this book are anger and fear and disgust. Now, disgust isn't always the right word. It's, sometimes it's too strong. Disdain, contempt, other kinds of relatives, cousins to that emotion. But anger, I think we recognize as a retributive emotion. If there's a grave crime has taken place, one of the things that often follows from that is that people get extremely angry about it. And, and maybe it's right that they do. Um, although the book discusses that and challenges that. I think anger may be a necessary way along the path, but it's absolutely not the destination. And I think few of us think that we act best when we're angry or act at our wisest when we're cross. Fear is something that is often conjured in political debate, isn't it? Politicians claim their policies will make us safer, Politicians at the moment will say, oh, well, look, the parole systems is endangering the public and, you know, all of, all of that stuff that we're uh, very familiar with. But sometimes I think the fear of crime um, is not what people are most frightened of. It's not always what most conjures uh, the, these anxieties. So particularly at times of social upheaval and of economic uncertainties, at times like that, People are feel vulnerable. Of course they do. Why wouldn't they? And crime becomes a ready kind of symbol of focus for, for, for those fears and anxieties. And this has got a bearing on something which we may later be discussing, if you wish, which is my work in other countries, because I have gone to countries, transitional democracies, and tried to, particularly in the east of Europe, in the former Soviet countries, and tried to 
encourage them to think of how they might reduce their prison populations and respond to crime in other ways. And I'm doing that at precisely the time of the greatest economic and social upheaval, at precisely the time when they are least disposed in the public debate to countenance suggestions of that kind, even if their political leaders think, yes, there's too much prison, it's expensive, it's destructive. Europe wants us to do things differently, but nevertheless, they have to take the public with them. So fear is, is another the third one discussed, I've already said, I think that's sometimes too strong, but it's the idea that somehow um, the people who have done very bad things um, fill us with a, a dismay that make us want to distance ourselves from them, which we can do, for example, by locking them up. And if you think about some grave crimes um, that have come into the newspapers recently, and when there comes a time for release, the language we express is often the language of fear. Will they do it again? But actually, I think what's driving this and makes much more sense of the debates is fear. This is, sorry, start again. What's really driving this is this feeling of disgust. This is someone who is not fit to live among us because of the appalling deeds that they've done. And if I'm right about that, then any amount of assurance from people like the probation service saying how good we can be at public protection is simply going to miss the point because it's not public protection that people are worried about, and it, or at least at that point. Um, and so if I'm right, I think I'm saying that this poses a real problem for community sentences because all community sentences in the nature of the case are not tough enough and unpleasant and burdensome enough to satisfy the needs of retributive anger. They can't provide the absolute security which we think prison provides in keeping us safe. And the thing that people like us, community people who, who uh, are champions of community sentences, one of the things that we're really proud of is that it allows people to remain in the community is exactly what an awful lot of people don't want. So when people say, oh, well, look, how are we going to change attitudes towards probation and how are we going to explain all this to people? A, a very important part of that debate, which I think has often been neglected, is the, the push and impetus of those emotions. And that's um, a big part of the thesis of the book. Because these are emotions that not only drive the will to punish, but also discourage us, dissuade us from calling an end to punishment. So that many people who have committed even not very serious crimes will continue to be looked at with suspicion and mistrust, sometimes contempt and disdain for very, very many years afterwards. Okay. What well, I want to come back to that you don't see that as as you create these concepts and understandings, you don't see that as thought leadership. Um, perhaps it's more uh, you're trying to define the debate. It's more thought shaping. Again, not even, I think I'm more rocking the boat necessary than trying to uh, shape the way that, that how people think. I, I want people to think more critically than they often do. Um, and to get behind some of the political assertions and assumptions that uh, underpin the uh, underpin an awful lot of criminal justice debate. Um, but again, I think it's it's not so much leadership. I'd like to give people enough in my books for them to disagree with me. Oh, um, let's say you assume you do that. Um, one of the things I'm sort of interested in is that lots of public debate seems driven to extremes, that the, the middle ground seems to be hollowed out and our political process, processes seem to be less nuanced. Um, do you find that in the debate about criminal justice as well, Rob? Very much so, particularly as it became party political, as you say, uh, people are encouraged to take sides. I have to say I'm a little bit worried about the concept of a middle ground. Um, because a lot of politicians speak as if a middle ground is a desirable place to find. Um, well, as British politics and American politics, I think, have moved quite a few strides to the right, where does that leave the middle ground now? Is the middle ground now the same position as it was, say, 20 years ago? 
what about the middle? If, for example, if one were a pacifist, you may have someone who's very bellicose at one extreme and someone who's a total pacifist at another. Is the middle ground well all right? Well, we'll have a few, <laughs> we'll have a few wars. But there's some things I think don't lend themselves to this metaphor of a middle ground. I think it's absolutely fine to be uh, radically committed to human rights, to be even extreme almost about the concept and the champion championing of human rights, which is not to say that you should necessarily indulge yourself in acts of extreme violence or so forth. I'm opposed to violence as a political position, but extremism, I'm not necessarily opposed to. It depends what you should be extreme about. There's some things I think we should be extreme about. Yeah, I guess the environment would be a good uh, uh, analogy uh, with global warming perhaps pressing us in a way with which we're experiencing every day. But let's 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 come back to uh, criminal justice and uh, across lots of societies, uh, crime does seem to uh, be a hot topic, um, whether it be uh, violence uh, against women on the streets or fears from uh, caused by immigration and uh, possibly as the, the financial pressures and increase in, in, in poverty uh, are increasing, that maybe violence and the fear that comes with that uh, and, and financial crime. Uh, do you see uh, that your, the, the thinking in your book will help understand better why punishment and the natural resorts to punishment may not be the answer? Certainly the book tries to attempt that because it, it, I think that many of the objectives that are set for punishment conspicuously fail. By and large, it doesn't uh, lead to satisfaction. Um, you know, victims of crime will often uh, feel exasperated even when uh, quite a weighty sentence has been imposed. This depends, of course, on the nature of the crime that we're talking about. But it seems that the criminal justice experience in court leaves everybody fairly dissatisfied at the end of it. We don't feel safer. I don't think we do when somebody says, aha, the going rate now for knife crime is going to be twice what it was a few months ago. And certainly this idea of feeling um, that that we that those who should not be among us are still among us. That doesn't. That's not um, assuaged. I think by by punishment. Um, so I think that um, oh, I've lost my thread at this point. Sorry, John. Can you remind me of what the, your question was? Yeah, it, it's it's whether punishing hard is the right answer as crime rises. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure that it isn't, because for me, criminal ju- the, the reason why an awful lot of crime does increase when it does, and it's hard to know when it does, um, because for all kinds of reasons that I think will be familiar to many people who are listening to this, um, what counts as a crime is very much the outcome of, of a particular process. Um, and when police are under pressure and so forth, then some processes get overlooked and and. Uh, so things don't get counted as crimes. But if crimes are going up, I'm sure that we need to look, first of all, uh, to matters of social justice. And this is another strong theme in the book, this idea of social justice. You mentioned crime on the against women on the streets, but of course, you know very well, and I'm not in any sense knocking the way you put that because I know what you mean. Um, but there's also crimes against people in their own homes, and we are becoming much more aware of that than we used to be. Um, and recognising the importance of that. There is a criminological discipline and approach to criminology, which uh, not everyone listening perhaps will be familiar with, which is known as zemiology. And our zemiology suggests we shouldn't discuss crimes, we should discuss social harms, of which crime is just one dimension. And some that the powerful people are able to say what we should get angry, frightened and disgusted about. But actually, there are many other things going on in the world. And global heating, as you spoke about earlier, is a very, very good example of that. This is massively, massively harmful. But typically, it doesn't engender the same kind of it's beginning to. But typically, it hasn't historically generated the same kind of anger or fear or the same disdain for people who wantonly pollute. And many zemiologists have spoken also about crimes of um, health and safety at work. 
You mentioned in your list, you spoke about financial, um, financial uh, crime. And again, this is not normally when when newspapers rant about crime. It's not normally that they have what that that they have in mind. And yet I wonder if, if there are clearly there were some people who saw a global pandemic as a new and exciting opportunities to make money for themselves and their friends. That disgusts me and enrages me. And in my career, when I've interviewed a number of people who've been to prison and been on probation, I'm not sure I've ever met anyone whose soul is so fundamentally corrupt as to regard things in that way. Um, so there's a whole load of financial crimes, improprieties, offshore scams, not necessarily scams because some of them are legal. But again, someone whose first instinct is to say, here we have a common wealth how am I going to make sure that I contribute to it as little as possible? These are things that maybe we should be angrier about, but they don't fall within the purview of punishment. Because although I've spoken about demo about emotions, there's also the, the, the whole consideration about um, inequalities of power, uh, who is in a position to determine what the problem is and what the problem is not. I think that's a good point, because that's uh, a provocative one, to move on to our next uh, area of discussion. You look like the cricket umpire there, dismissing me. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just moving. Uh, I'm just moving. I'm just moving on. Okay. Well, the reason we're talking now is that you've recently announced your retirement, and I want to ask: Was it a hard decision? Um, was it a hard decision? It was a bit of a hard decision because there's certain aspects of. Um, work, particularly my research and writing, that I'm very keen not to stop. But I do think that while I am fit and well, I've reached retirement age, and while I'm lucky enough to enjoy good health, that now is probably a good time uh, to, to leave. So I say, I hope to carry on and keep up a certain, certain connections. I would love to continue to be seen as a member of the probation family um, and also the, the, the scholarly community. But um, again, it's not a secret. I, for 45 years, family and work has been everything to me. My life has been full of, of nothing much else. And so I'm now going to, with the children all grown up now and living away, um, and poor Mrs. Canton having me constantly under her feet, there will need to be some reappraisal of, of, of what I'm going to do. And I don't yet know. Um, I happened to my final day as a Montfort University is this coming Friday. So I have just three or four more days of, of gainful employment. Mm. Have you um, thought strategically about what you're going to do? Or is that something that you're going to give your mind to over the coming weeks, months? I've never been sure what strategy is. Um, it does take us into the question of leadership, doesn't it? I'm afraid it does. Um, I mentioned, I admitted earlier that I studied uh, philosophy at university, but I also, as you, John, know, but not many people listening will know, um, studied Greek and Latin. And uh, strategy, uh, a strategos was a general. It was a leader of an army, if that's where that word uh, uh, originates. Um, I, the, many people who talk a lot about strategy turn out, I think, to be conspicuously weak at it. And when people talk about strategy, I'm reminded of the adage, which many will have heard before, how do you make God laugh? Answer, tell him your plans. Um, because I, my own personal experience is that life has a way of tripping us up and giving us all kinds of things, good as well as bad, but I think I need to live the experience of not having a job for a while before I'm going to be even in a position to want to make plans. But I'm, I have to be careful not to slip into to idleness because sometimes the structure of employment, that's the thing I think I'm most frightened of losing. Employment gives you a structure, doesn't it, to your day. You have things in your diary. Um, and I will need to find a different kind of structure. And that's something I must do because I've seen some people who don't cope so well with that. And that doesn't, that often leads to unhappiness. Mm. I heard of a, a deputy head who, uh, when she retired, just created a new timetable. Um, do you think there's any danger you'll do that? No. <laughs> 
No, no, I, I don't think I can, I can have a timetable, but I will still, I will still keep a diary. Um, at the moment, um, there's not a great deal in that, in that diary, but then for university people, August is always a fairly quiet month compared to the rest of the year. But I think I will begin to notice things and miss things as the um, autumn comes upon us and as the days get a little bit shorter and walking perhaps becomes less appealing, although I try to get out whatever the weather. Even on our hottest day, John Scott, I walked five miles um, on the hottest day last week. And did you carry a parasol? Uh, no, it's not a bad idea. I've got a silly hat. Um, which I wore, and sunglasses, of course, and I tried to avoid the, the worst heat of the day. Well, that, that makes some sense. I want to take a little, uh, maybe a retrospective, and think about the route uh, that you walked in your career, because you started off uh, as, a, as a practitioner. Uh, how, how did you, did you fall into probation, or did you choose it? I really did fall into it. As, as a classicist and followed and an ancient historian and philosophy student at uh, at the university, when I graduated, an awful lot of my colleagues were thinking about. Some of them went into industry, which never particularly appealed to me. Um, other the traditional, well-known traditional routes uh, for classicists are the civil service. I didn't really know what that was, but I didn't much like the sound of it. Um, and also teaching. And I wasn't clever enough to be a university academic in classics or philosophy, even if, um, you know, even if that had appealed. I'd had enough, I, I felt, of, of that, at least for the time being. And I went to a, a phone box. You remember phone boxes? We used to put money in slots. And uh, I went to a phone box and I phone, <laughs> phoned up social services and said, I'm wondering about a career in social work. Is there anybody there who could advise me? And they said, oh, um, oh hold on, please. So I shoveled about a week's worth of coins into the box and in the end thought, blow this for a lark and put the phone down because <laughs> I had been on for ages. So I then went off and I refilled my pockets with coins and rang up the probation service and spoke to an extremely helpful woman who asked if I'd like to come and meet the chief probation officer the following day. And I did. I went to see the chief probation officer who welcomed me and uh, told me that uh, as well as being the chief probation officer of Oxfordshire, he was also the secretary, it's a man called K.D. Thompson, who was a bit of a legend in his, in his day. And he told me he was a secretary of um, a hostel for people coming out of prison. Uh, and would I like a job there? Um, he offered me on the spot, not really knowing anything at all about me, and offered me the princely salary of uh, £1,000 a year minus the board and lodging uh, of living on the, on the premises where I had a little flat of my own. And uh, I did that for more than a year. And I decided, I said to my mum at the time, I said, I'm going to do this for a month because I won't really know whether I'm any good at it or whether I like it. And that first month, that was unsettling, but, but terribly exciting. And then I absolutely loved it. Um, it, was, it became a huge pleasure. I thought I had a fabulous year working there. And it turned out that the people in that hostel, as well as coming from prison, some of them had come from special hospitals. Uh, Broadmoor wasn't very far away. And a member of our management committee had been the probation officer, liaison probation officer at Grendon Underwood uh, Psychiatric Prison. So a very large proportion of our residents were people who had uh, a background of, of mental unwellness. Um, and, and that also became a, a career long interest of mine. And then somebody said, well, you should train to be a probation officer. And uh, a, a good friend advised me to, uh, to go to Nottingham, said it was a good course. I went to Nottingham and I've never left. As you transitioned from being a practitioner, I think um, you love practice, if I, you know, if I understand you best. Uh, and you didn't take a managerial route uh, but you did become a training manager, if I'm right. Yeah, if, I, yeah. if I'm right, um, it's it's a bit of a challenge back to you. Um, you were quite uh, happy to be a, the head of the train, uh, head of training, but not you didn't want to be a boss. Is that right? That's I think that's exactly right. Um, I've always been 
not very good at doing as I'm told and not very good at telling other people what to do. Uh, and the, the management route was one that never particularly appealed to me. And I'm, I'm not even sure that I would have applied to become a senior probation officer had not the opportunity of working in um, the former, you'll remember them, the SPOTs, the Senior Probation Officers Training, mm. which was a home office funded thing. And uh, when the Nottinghamshire position uh, became vacant, um, I applied for that. Um, but I'm not sure even then, you know, even then people were talking, well, OK, you're going to go into training, but only for a while. You will be expected to go and work as a, an SPO in, in management. And I was I was comfortable with that. I was OK about that. And after a while, I was keen to do that. So I did operate as a, as a middle manager, but I never had any ambitions to be an assistant chief or, or, a, or a chief probation officer. Um, it's hard to know exactly why, uh, but I, I don't think it played to, to my what I believe to be my particular strengths. So it's back to not necessarily leadership, Rob, but um, I think you've liked being in a team, but not necessarily... Um, pulling the levers, I'm going to say, of power. Is that the right way of putting it? Yeah, I, I think I think that's a, a good way of putting it. And I've always been suspicious of people who want to. You know, a, a good, a, a, the first chief probation officer I worked with, Colin Edwards, the late Colin Edwards in Nottinghamshire. I was at a training event with us for in a lot of you know seniors, and Colin was at this event, and somebody asked him what he thought was the most important quality of leadership, and he said empowerment. And I thought hard about that, and it stayed with me, obviously, because we're going back many, many years ago now. But I, I'm, very, I'm okay with that. I think you have leaders who are empowering, who trust their staff, who want to um, guide their staff, but then trust them and enable that enable them to to uh, fulfill their their uh, potential and to let their abilities flourish and then you have people who are of a very different kind um who want to to do everything and, and take all the decisions for you which often leads to an atmosphere of mistrust and a sense of uh, uh, of interference and over the years i have been very, very fortunate to have worked with more of the former kind, the people who I might, for want of a better term, called leaders, who lead by empowerment, who lead by trusting staff, who lead by example. And on the other hand, the, the managers, as again, this it's a very crude distinction, I know, but the, the, the managers who seem to want to tell you what to do. And I have had examples of, of <coughs> people in management who become impatient with ditherers like me <clears throat> and want to move quickly to take a decision, sometimes before they've really grasped the nature of the problem that they are trying to solve. One of the things over your career, whether it be in uh, practice or in a university, is you'll have seen loads of changes. Um, and I'm, as you're looking back, so this is a bit of a re retrospective, what are the changes you've seen in probation that you regret? Gosh, that's a big question. I think it's the way in which um, central government, because central government recognised the political salience of matters to do with criminal justice, it became much, much more hands-on. So... The service that I joined and that you joined um, was called, in your case, was it Bedfordshire, your first service, John? And, you know, in mine, no, no. Berkshire. Bar yeah, I'm sorry. Of course it was Berkshire. Um, and in my case, the Nottinghamshire probation service or probation and aftercare service. But it was a service. It was a local service. It was run by um magistrates and uh, and they had a liaison judge and they had maybe from the county council and so on but over the years that became much more centralized and i think the the uh, the statement of national objectives and priorities wasn't it in the in the uh, 1980s if i'm not mistaken 1984 perhaps was a very strong statement by the home office because then we didn't have a ministry of justice did we uh, but that that central government is in charge and that i think has continued and has been it was 
in a way, was mitigated by the creation of the boards and the trusts and so forth. But now we have a national service. And while we must celebrate the return of this to the public sector, um, I wish that there was a much stronger local emphasis than I am able to discern. Um, I don't accept that London knows best. And I think we are very much in the hands of uh, politi politicians if we allow all of that to, to operate um, nationally. And there seems to be this extraordinary concern about postcode justice or whatever. We've got postcode everything. We know that the experience of living in different parts of country is different. And it, it's fascinating, isn't it, that we know that a guiding principle in probation practice is responsivity. People are not all the same and different ways of engaging with those people need to be discovered. And yet we seem reluctant to acknowledge that that's surely also true of communities. Some communities do differ from one another. And it's never been, for me, a problem if, for example, practice in Durham differs from practice in Cornwall. If the good folk of those two areas are content with what they have, then hooray, and it doesn't trouble me. Other changes you've seen that you like? Um, it's hard, isn't it, here? No, I, I love the way, I don't know if it's a change so much as a continuity. I applaud the way in which people continue to join the service for, re um, for reasons that I recognise and respect. They want to make a difference for the better. They want to take pride in what it is that they do. And they also think that they want to help people. If you talk to people, and I'm sure you have, John, many, many people over the years about why they joined the probation service, why do you want to be a probation officer? A question to which I myself have never had a very convincing answer, except that I tried something like it, like it and enjoyed it a lot, <laughs> which is probably a good enough answer. Um, but they will use the word help. And I once couldn't resist teasing someone in the home office who said, oh, well, you know, we're into punishment in the community. I said, well, look, wouldn't you be just a little bit worried if your daughter came to you and said, when I grow up, mummy, I want to punish people. Uh, it's all right. It's in the community. I mean, the, what kind of <laughs> motivation is that? Well, OK, so let's take um, motivation and ask you about how um, are we going to shape the probation service for the future. What are the skills that are necessary for the future, do you think? Because we're in, uh, I think, a very risky point. Um, probation in the UK has been taken back into uh, the, uh, the national uh, service completely. I think it's still pretty vulnerable. Um, what skills do we need to grow for the probation service to be healthy in the UK? Do you mean practitioner skills? Yeah, yeah. I think the practitioner skills are, are still fairly well established. The skills of, uh, of engaging with people who might not always want to engage with you, uh, resilience, emotional literacy. I think that's a neglected and important concept. Um, communication, teamwork, all these things that I, th I haven't got any particularly novel uh, contribution to, to make uh, to, to, to that. But I think those are skills that need to be sustained and are difficult to sustain when people are under so much workload pressure and under the sort of political volatility. So I'm aware that uh, recently Mr. Raab has made announcements about probation's contribution to the parole decision process. Uh, Twitter's been full of discussions about this. And those things I know are felt very acutely. People feel that the value of what they do and the contributions they're able to make are taken away from them or undermined and for all the wrong reasons. Mm. So, so I'm not about plowing huge resources into the probation service. I think that would be um, a mistake, but giving staff more latitude to use the resources and their own time in ways that they judge appropriate rather than a managerial attempt to to shape the parameters of what they do too tightly so if we say we took um a teaching equivalent uh, it's leaving uh, the classroom teacher to get on and teach rather than set the curriculum and tell them what to do all the time yeah i think that's right i think you give people a secure education 
um, in the knowledge and the skills and the values of what it is that you expect of them. And then you trust them. You continue to hold them accountable for the decisions that they take. But an early paper that I wrote um, some years ago with my friend Tina Eady draws a, tries to draw a distinction between accountability and discretion. I think you can consistently allow people significant discretion, but at the same time continue to hold them accountable for the decisions that they take. I don't see a tension in that. But national standards early on said there's too much idiosyncrasy in probation practice we should tighten this, we should circumscribe discretion because that's the best way to secure accountability. And Tina and I said, no, it isn't. So do you think professionalism is the best way of ach achieving accountability? Um, again, most professions, I think, have tried to assert a degree of discretion for themselves, but I suspect that a number of professions would protest that that too has been constrained. Um, certainly in teaching, um, in universities, in schools, in medicine. Um, in, in, I don't know. Uh, I would imagine that a lot of these people feel that their discretion is has been significantly curtailed, um, often for, re for political reasons. Mm. and or resource reasons. Okay, well, let, let's take a different sort of uh, future look. Um, where do you think the future ideas are coming from? Because um, in a way, you could say there could be a battle for the, the soul, soul of criminal justice coming up. Um, uh, and some people say that uh, social work uh, should be the future for, for probation, but social work itself, you could say, is a profession under attack um, because of what's happened about um, frequent inquiries, whether it be about uh, mental health or what's happened to children, child neglect, and so many people being taken into, into the care system. Uh, how do you see uh, the battle for, for thought leadership uh, about probation for the future? Gosh, another enor enormous question. Um, I don't know if you remember the name of Ivan Illich, uh, was another influencer of, uh, on, had influence on me, which you who protested about trying to find technical solutions for non-technical problems, for problems of living. And one of his most famous works uh, was about the about medicine, about how medicine, if we're not careful. Medicine is not the answer to ill health and can indeed often generate illnesses of its own. And I think this is exactly the same for criminal justice. You do not get a peaceful and respectful society by um, through the institutions of criminal justice. It's just not how people are. And more than that, we know, don't we, labelling theory is one overused but nevertheless instructive idea in criminology about how criminal justice intervention can offer often make things worse and there are example are there not of heavy-handed policing perhaps sometimes of minority eth minoritized ethnic communities where as a result of insensitive policing um the the whole relationship between the police and the community has been damaged to the detriment of both um, and I think in just the same way, criminal justice can do harm and it cannot do much to make us safer. Now, it can do a bit just as people are healthy because of the food that they eat and the air that they breathe and the lifestyles that they have. That's what determines people's health. And none of those are medical matters. Similarly, criminal justice crime is prevented and reduced by people having respect for one another, by people having fair social opportunities, by being relieved from poverty. Again, nothing to do with criminal justice. But if you break a leg, you'll value a good medical service. And there's some people, I think, who in some circumstances where a criminal justice intervention as an acute uh, intervention um, is a necessary thing to, to, to undertake. But it's the wrong thought to suppose that the way to make for a safer and more peaceful society is to invest significantly in expanding criminal justice processes. But it's what the, all political parties seem to do, isn't it? Mm. As crime, let's have more police, let's have more prosecution. 
So generally, you're against over-interference, is that right? I think that's right. Um, uh, yes, and, and I think that applies to uh, leadership in organisations. I would, again, like to trust people to live their lives, but you need to provide auspicious circumstances in which they can flourish. And with the social injustices in our society, these generate opportunities, I think, for crime and leave people with many fewer options than I would like them to enjoy. Mm -hmm. If you think about why most people in the middle classes don't commit crimes, and of course, a lot of people do in the middle classes, it's just that it's looked at in a rather different way. It's simply that we think, well, that's not the kind of people that we are, but we also aren't under those huge pressures of poverty that uh, assail most people. And I think this is true of crime. I think it's true of good parenting. I've never met anyone who set out to be a bad parent, but they find themselves taking unhappy paths and sometimes not being the parents they might have liked to be, um, but just because their circumstances are so difficult. I'm going to change the subject again, if I may. Sure. Um, we've mentioned international work, and um, I'd be very interested to know why the international dimension has been so important to you. Well, it was such a thrilling opportunities, opportunity when it first arose, John. Um, <clears throat> I was a visiting lecturer at the University of Nottingham for a while. And in 1999, I became aware of a project that they were doing in Ukraine. And I knocked on a door and said, I know that you're doing a probation project in Ukraine. I would love to participate. And this was being done in partnership with the Inner London Probation Service. So I was advised to contact, first of all, John Harding, um, who was then the chief in Inner London. And he was good enough to give me, I owe a lot to John, he was good enough to give me that opportunity. And I did it, first of all, just because it was different and exciting and novel. And I, I didn't have, in 1999, I, I'm not sure I even had a passport. The children were very small. We never thought of taking our holidays overseas. I think I'd let our passports lapse. <clears throat> For me, the Far East was Skegness or perhaps North Sea Camp in Lincolnshire. And the chance of going to uh, a place like Ukraine was, was just exciting. Uh, I was lucky enough to do that project with a couple of other really good folk who I enjoyed working with. And it was in the course of that that I met um, another person who, to whom I owe a great deal, the late Norman Bishop. Um, Norman died last year, was it? Or maybe 18 months ago at the age of 99. And when I first met Norman, he was in his late 70s, maybe even early 80s, and he worked with the Council of Europe. Bags of energy, very inspirational. We met in Kiev <clears throat> and I wrote him subsequently and he then it was through Norman entirely that I was approached by the Council of Europe and asked if I would like to join a committee for the reform of the Russian penal system. And you can imagine that these were, you know, for me, thrilling opportunities. My horizons had been very limited. And then, as you know, these things then snowball. You, you find that if you do, if you're considered personable and reliable, and uh, if they enjoy working with you, then other opportunities will arise. So for the following 20 years or so, I became absorbed in work of that kind and really enjoyed those opportunities. So what, what have you learned? What has that dimension brought to your thinking? 101 things. First of all, policy transfer, as it's sometimes described, is better understood as knowledge exchange. If you go to a country and say, do it like this, then that's never going to work. And again, this is another perhaps echoes the point we're making about not telling people what to do, but allowing them to express what they take to be the, those concerns and sharing your experience, telling them about what has worked for you and also the mistakes that you have made. So I think that um, England and Wales for some years believed that um, the proliferation of community sanctions would reduce the prison population usually doesn't. Um, and it's important, I think, to share those experiences um, with, with, with other countries. I was thinking that one of the things that your chance to look at comparative systems might be helpful about was uh, uh, 
uh, about learning about how different cultures might uh, react to community justice. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, post-communism uh, and them listening to philosophical debates with very different uh, personal experiences. You know, they've come out of very constrained uh, political circumstances. And I'm wondering, um, there are some things that uh, people who've lived in uh, post-war circumstances, which have taken freedom for granted, for example, uh, we now see what's tear, uh, tearing at the structure of Ukraine. Ironic that that was your first yeah. experience. I'm wondering, as a philosopher or with a philosophy background, what 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 repercussions that's had in your thinking. Well, I think one of the <clears throat> the first thoughts I had was that we often looked in this country, we looked to the state to protect us, and the state says we will do that through systems of criminal justice. In countries with a different kind of legacy, and Ukraine is among those countries, one of the biggest risks to you precisely is the state. <laughs> one of the things you, from which you need protection is, is the state. And I think it was the University of Nottingham as much as anyone, the, the other people on that project, who taught me that the really important thing to try to promote is human rights. And if you can enhance uh, human rights, then that is a, 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 a fundamental achievement. Um, and that's the thing to, to strive for, because I suppose another thing that I learned this, I think, perhaps from Norman in the Council of Europe, in the time when that committee was running, the, the one about the reform of the Russian prison system, Russia, and of course, things change all the time, don't they? Nothing is forever. <clears throat> but it was possible to have a significant optimism about the future of the Russian Federation. They had been a global leader in numbers of people in prison. They were right up there with the United States of America. And for the duration of, the, of that committee, and not, I'm wanting to say, because of that committee alone, but in that period of time, their prison population dro dropped enormously. There were hundreds of thousands of people um, were no longer in prison. The prison population really, really reduced itself. And I remember Baroness Stern, Vivian Stern, saying, if Russia can do this, maybe there's even hope for America. And one of the things that I think made a difference here was that we were sitting around a table, the Council of Europe, with some influential people, the Minister of Justice of the Russian Federation, the head of the prison administration in, in, the Rus in Russia, and it's very, very heavy, you know, significant players. And it was the mood music, not the techniques. It was the, the way in which we managed to gain their trust by listening with respect and good humour and patience and enjoying a social side to it as well. We did things that we enjoyed each other's company. And this, I think, did empower them to go back and, and say, we want to do, we want to make some of these changes and these are the changes that we can make. Um, and this is what Europe is encouraging us, encouraging us to do. And I think that did make it easier for them um, to make the kind of political changes that were being sought at the time. And it's interesting at that time, I should say, that um, Vladimir Putin was regarded as a new and exciting visionary who was committed to reducing the Russian prison population. There's something rather sobering, isn't there, about um, those conversations and uh, where conversation and creating relationships seemed to be able to take you, albeit maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, and where we are today. But the international dimension to your work has is probably going to continue. Um, do you think you'll still have opportunities to work abroad, Rob, in the next phase? I'm really not sure, John. I was, um, like everyone, you know, the internet, the, the lockdown was the, one of the first things. But I have, I don't really enjoy the travel anymore. Um, 20 years ago, it was thrilling. It was a novelty. I thought, this is great. I want to do more of this. But I did then do quite a lot of it. And I remember one particular occasion running and just failing to catch a train at St Pancras um, on the way back from Serbia on a Friday night, knowing that on Sunday I was setting off to Jordan. 
And I just began to think, I really can't do this much longer. I was just, I was beginning to get tired. The enthusiasm was beginning to wane. And on each and every trip, I think I, you know, I got a lot from, from all of these trips. I had some wonderful times in these countries, but I am less enthusiastic and more of a home bird. So maybe the wonders of the internet will mean you'll have to do more zooming like this. More zooming, more writing, um, all of those, all of those things. So your thought leadership will have to be Zoom leadership, maybe. <laughs> that and the writing. Okay. So as we perhaps draw to, to a conclusion, um, I'm thinking that some of our uh, listeners or, or viewers uh, may think, okay, when the time comes for me to hang up my boots metaphorically, having scored lots of hat tricks for Nottingham Forest metaphorically, um, uh, how do I set out to be the sort of person that writes books and uh, influence people through lecturing? What advice do you give to someone starting out, Rob? It's so hard, isn't it? Because the at the moment at uh, De Montfort University, they recruited a number of people to participate on the probation education programmes who have come from practice. And they are sometimes diffident, sometimes a, a bit daunted, I think, by the whole scholarly community. And I think the universities have a bit to answer for here. Um, if you take something like the Probation Journal, which is an excellent periodical, when I started writing for the Probation Journal, um, it was enough to have some good ideas and to try to express them well. But over time, academics need to publish, so they write a lot. Practitioners are too busy to publish, so they write relatively less. And there's always some smart aleck academic who's going to come along and say, oh, well, you've written this paper, but you've completely neglected the contribution of dot, dot, dot. And that all of this stuff, I think, if we're not careful, can amount to a sort of bullying that, uh, that uh, makes sure that practitioners' voice is, is less heard. It's got better. And under the excellent current editorship of, of Nicola Carr, I think practitioner voices are being encouraged to be expressed. And as indeed our service user voices, these are also uh, be becoming more to the surface. But I think the advice I would give is write, because the only way to <clears throat> learn to write is to write. Find a friend who will give you feedback. Better still, find a friend to write with because a good combination, um, I mentioned earlier, didn't I, that I'd written something, one of my earliest publications with, was with Tina Eady. Um, and <clears throat> it turned out we worked well together. Tina is uh, disciplined and focused and well-ordered, and we generated ideas between us, but she was a finisher, if you like. Um, whereas at that time, I think I was a gifted midfielder who could stroke the ball around elegantly, but maybe not always managed to put it in the back of the net. <clears throat> so I think that that is um, a, a, a good partner, but you just have to do it really, um, like uh, most things. <laughs> so your sign off line of advice would be um, be a team player? Be a team player. And whether you are a leader or a manager or working with a service user or an academic, remember that the way to get the best out of people is to treat them well with kindness and respect. So human rights on a personal scale is, is really what you're about. That's what I aspire to be about. I mean, no doubt I have many shortcomings as we all do. Well, Rob, that's a really good sign off. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this session. And to our viewers and listeners, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please stay safe. And I hope you can join us next time. Um, podcasts on this and other topics are available on your normal provider, uh, iTunes or, or Google or under the INCJ podcast label. Goodbye and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, John. Thank you. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, Conversations about International Criminal Justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us 
on Twitter at INTCJ Network. <laughs>